Well, if you have a copy of the scriptures, and I hope that you do, would you join me in John's gospel in the New Testament? Whether you're here in the room and you need to borrow a scripture that's in the back or take one home with you or you're joining us online, we're so grateful that you'd lead in with us. And we want you to know where we're reading and teaching and learning from so that the other six days of the week, when we're not gathered together, that you can feast off of what Jesus is feeding you and teaching you. And here's what I want you to know. Uh, After every time we spend together in scripture... There ought to be something we apply. There ought to be something we do. If you don't drive a stake into the spiritual soil of your life or if if you don't have a a, a moment where you remember and declare, this is what I'm going to do with what I've seen, what I've heard, and what I've experienced, most likely it will stay right inside these four walls. And it will not make it into the other 167 hours of your week, which is where if we really follow Jesus, most likely it's going to take place mostly outside these walls. If there was an application point, if there was a to-do, here it is today. When you leave here, I don't want you to do anything for Jesus. I don't want you to do anything at all for Jesus before you first spend time being with Jesus. I don't want you to spend time doing for Jesus until you have first been with Jesus. And let me show you exactly what I'm talking about from John's gospel. Would you stand with me in honor of God's word as we read in John chapter 15 verses 1 through 8 together. Jesus said, I'm the true vine and my father is the gardener and every branch in me that does not produce fruit he removes and he also prunes every branch that does produce fruit so that it will produce even more fruit. You are already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Now remain in me and I in you. Now just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing apart from me. If anyone does not remain in me, he's thrown aside like a branch and he withers and the people gather them and throw them into the fire and they're burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. For my Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, there is no God but you. Would you stretch the hearts of our lives, spiritually speaking, so wide and so open that we would see hear, receive, and put down roots that grow and flourish so that we may not only produce spiritual fruit, which brings the church joy, but glorifies your Father in the city of Nashville, in Middle Tennessee, and around the world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, context is everything. And when we read this text, the context is that Jesus was spending the last few moments of his life with the disciples. This conversation between him and this ragtag group of young men who were teenagers or in their early 20s happens within the final moments and the final hours of Jesus' life in the upper room before he is arrested and betrayed and tried and crucified on the cross at Calvary. And of all the things Jesus could have told the men, I want you to think about this. Someone comes to you and says, you've got hours, you've only got a couple of days left. What are the most important things you want to pass on to others, to pass on to the next generation? One of my mentors said, it's not as important what we pass on to the next generation, but what we leave in them 
that matters most. And of all the things that Jesus chose to share with the disciples, he shares a metaphor or a picture about a vineyard and being the true vine and them as disciples being the branches that are connected to the true vine. I've got a picture that I'll show here on the screen of a vineyard. You're going to see the main vine that runs across what is a wire that holds it up off the ground. The main vine comes out of the ground, and you can see the vine as it is weaving its way across through this vineyard. The branches come off of that, and ultimately, if successful, they produce grapes. They produce fruit. And Jesus is simply using a metaphor, we leave that picture up here for just a moment, of something they would have seen all the time in Galilee and Judea and in Israel. Uh, I got to see this firsthand several years ago. My aunt and uncle who have property in East Texas, they had a vineyard, I was able to see this. And as I thought about this text and those disciples walking through there, I'm going to illustrate the obvious because many of us, we don't see vineyards or we don't spend much time around them. But Jesus is simply saying, I'm the true vine. And what comes out of me is life-giving. It's the source of life. And every branch that's connected at me has a chance to do this, to flourish, to grow. And I would suggest that we would all say, just intuitively, I want to do well. I want to be healthy. I want to flourish. I want to find significance and purpose. And Jesus is simply saying, if you remain in me, if you stay connected to me, then you have a chance to become everything the Father intended for you to be and for you to enjoy. And one of the things that I want to point out, that the source of this potential growth, the source of this potential flourishing, comes from remaining and abiding or being with Jesus. Now, one of the things I want to challenge you to do, we only read eight verses. That ain't going to kill anybody in here, okay? Like, you can go later this week, and you can sit down on Monday, you can sit down on Tuesday, all six days of the coming week, and you can read these eight verses over and over and over again. Keep a highlighter with you, keep a ballpoint pen with you, and underline the word remain. In eight verses, seven times, Jesus says remain. Remain, 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 remain. Your translation may say abide, abide with me. Here's here's the essence of remaining or abiding. It means to be present and to be with. Jesus didn't say, I'm about to be crucified, and my Father has a massive plan that one day, 2,000 years from now, there will be people that will huddle up on 8th Avenue South in the city of Nashville, and you guys can't comprehend that, but that's where this is headed, so I need y'all to get busy. we got a lot of work to do. He didn't say that. He didn't say, this is it. It's coming to a conclusion, so like, do this for me. He said, be with me. We're human beings, right? Now, this sounds silly to say it, but we need to be reminded of this. And some of us in the room, need Holy Spirit need to wake us up to remind us of this. Bring us together so we can all hear. You are a human being. You're not a human doing. And Jesus cares more about you being with him than he cares about what you do for him. And you better not try to do anything for Jesus consistently over time until you are first and consistently abiding and being with him. I don't want anybody to leave this church building because church is not the the building. This is is the facility, the gospel outpost God's given us in the city to be his hands and feet. But I don't want anybody leaving this brick and mortar to go do for Jesus before you are first abiding with Jesus. And for some of us, that's like the most discouraging downer that you could be told. Now, I'm not saying I believe it's a downer. I'm telling you, like, in in our flesh, that's not, like, productive. I don't know if there's any Enneagram 1s in the room. I have a dear friend who's an Enneagram 1 who is very matter-of-fact and exacting and has a plan and has to work that plan, and that plan has to have check boxes to feel like God is accomplishing something in and through him. And he said, I hate this text because it means i got to put my plans on hold and sit and be with Jesus. Now, I want you to think about that phrase out loud. This is so discouraging, i got to sit and be with Jesus. Now, most of us wouldn't say that. But I'm going to challenge us and encourage you, do you behave like that? Too busy to slow down. Too busy to pray. Too much going on to stop. Because our flesh wants to accomplish things. Now, don't, don't hear me say you shouldn't have a plan 
Don't hear me say you, you shouldn't be exacting in your future. Where are you going to be five years? Where are you going to be five minutes? Where are you going to be five days? Like, it's good to have plans. It's good to think about your future. I'm surprised how many people are reactive or not proactive in life. Like, that's all good and well. I'm not saying that can't be true. What I'm telling you is I think we spend so much time on our checklist and to-dos and all these things because they feel more productive. And quite honestly, in our flesh, they're more gratifying than sitting and being still with Jesus. That requires time. That requires patience. And that is a deliberate act of trust. I trust that whatever it is you need to get done, you can do without me. I trust that whatever it is you need to produce in my life, you, you can still do if I slow down long enough to be with you. But I'm going to tell you, brevity or quickness or expediency, not only in our culture, but in the church in North America, expediency comes at the cost of shallow soil. Expediency, wanting to microwave stuff, being impatient, it comes at the cost of of shallow spiritual soil and roots can't grow deep. You cannot flourish. You can't produce spiritual fruit. You can't get where you want to get and where God wants you to get there quicker than you want to get there without abiding and remaining and having fertile spiritual soil in your heart and your life where the roots can grow down. But unfortunately, a lot of times what's valued is the shallowness in our culture than the depth which is cultivated over time with Jesus. It's convicting, right? Now, I, I don't know why this is, but this is how the Holy Spirit's hardwired me. I hear from the Lord. I'm rejuvenated from the Lord. I'm convicted from the Lord when I'm in nature. So I like to landscape. I like to dabble in the soil a little bit. I do not have a green thumb. I kill more things than I bring forth, okay? But I have some rhythms in my life where I'm reminded, like, look, Aaron, your flesh wants instant gratification. You want it now, but anything worth having is going to take time. And that's how Jesus works, and you can wait on him because he's waited on you for a long time to come to, come to grips with some of what he wants you to know. And so, um, listen, I, I like to landscape, and I, and I, and I planted some, some Leland cypress in my yard, and uh, just as a screen of a little bit of privacy, and I bought them because they're supposed to grow uh, three or four feet a year. They've been planted a year. Uh, I was out there with my ruler the other day. We're looking at 8.5 inches. Uh, I want to go back to Lowe's and be like, uh, I have been sold a bill of goods. This thing promised this, and like we are undershooting this thing by two and a half feet. But, but here's the deal. like We laugh. But, but once a month, I'll see those slow growing. They're, they're, they're green. They're flourishing. They survive the winter. It's slow growing. I'll see it, and I'll laugh to myself. And, and the Holy Spirit, I don't hear an audible voice, but a gentle nudge in your spirit. Yeah, that's how I work. Anything worth having is going to take time, Aaron. It's just going to take time. And we got plants in the house. I saw a fiddle fig leaf tree in somebody's house. You ever seen one of those? Somebody just was like, amen, over here on this side, okay? Like, these things are beautiful, and I saw it in imitation is the greatest form of flattery. So I was like, the Bryant house will have a full-grown fiddle fig leaf tree in our corner of our den. And then I went to Lowe's again. And those things, you're going to have to drop 200 bones to buy one of those that's full-grown. It's like, Lord, we're in a capital campaign. I don't think this is good stewardship here. Like, I just, <laughs> I don't. But for $15, I could buy a starter fiddle fig leaf. So I brought it home. And do you know how long it takes for these things to grow to full maturity, 15 years, a decade and a half. Jesus may return before that. So in my home, I'm learning whether or not agriculture responds to positive reinforcement. Come on, you can do this. It's sitting right there on the little hallway table. You, can, you look so good today. Here's a little drink. Like, come on, come on. And it ain't going to happen. And I, look, I'm making light of it, but I'm illustrating the obvious. I, I put things around me that remind me of how God works. To convict, to comfort. It's okay, Aaron. That's, that's how he works. If you follow me on Instagram, you know I, I like to go to the American Southwest. I got some friends out there. They let me bunk up at their house for free. I go, I travel, I hike where there's no cell signal. Might not be another human within five miles. And I open up the scripture and I read text and I sit and I wait. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, the reason Jesus got up early and went out in the desert, like when, when a crow flies over, I can hear the bones in his wings flapping. When, when everything else is stripped away, 
your senses are heightened. And so when I wait on the Lord to speak and I, and I don't put him on my agenda or my timetable, speak, Lord, for your servants listening. And it could be 60 minutes, it could be an hour, and I, I'll feel a gentle nudge or I'll read a text and be like, it, it don't benefit me in any way, but I read it and I'm like, man, God is so good. He is such a good God. I just want to sit here and savor that he is so good and faithful to his people. And he's speaking to me. I don't know what your rhythms are. Fine, you're like, man, I don't want a green thumb. I don't want to do anything what you just described. Fine, whatever. Uh, unplug, get off the grid. I've got a friend that, that takes his lunch every day to work, and when he goes, uh, he goes out and sits on a park bench with no AirPods, with nothing, and just sits there and waits for the Lord to speak. And if the Lord doesn't speak, he's like, he didn't say anything to me today, but that's okay. Do what you do that you know best puts you in a place to be reminded of being with Jesus and push back. Here's my challenge to you. Just, I'm not going to say for the rest of your life do this because that would be like overwhelming. But if I said for six days until the Holy Spirit gathers us again on the Lord's Day next Sunday, be with Jesus and push back on the fleshly, selfish tendency to feel like you've accomplished something at the end of the day. If all Jesus communicates to you is it was so good to be with you, thank you for making time for me today. I mean, in light of God sending Jesus, fully God and fully human, to lay down his life in exchange for our brokenness on the cross, that you can be covered with his robe of righteousness. That when God looks at you because of your faith in Jesus, he doesn't see your past. He doesn't see all the things about your life that you'd like to change. He sees you, and in Christ you measure up. And only in Christ you are enough. And he says, well done. Gosh, how many of us would kill just to, just to know like we've pleased him that we were with him. Well, guess what? You can do it today. You don't have to, you don't have to wait. Don't do anything for Jesus before you're spending time being with him. And, and by the way, he said, I, I'm the true vine. And just, just make sure you're, if you don't do anything else as a follower of Jesus, make sure you're connected to that vine. We saw this earlier in John. I don't just raise people from the dead. I can do that too, but I am the resurrection and the life. I, I don't just protect the church, the flock, but I am the gate that stands between the world and you, and I'll always have your back. I am the resurrection and life. I am the gate. I am the way. I am the truth. I am life. I am the one and only true vine. You better make sure you're connected to me. And some of us in the room are connected to false vines. Some of us in the room are connected to vines that promise you things they cannot fulfill. And if the true vine gives life, a false vine can take life. When I was little, we used to go to my grandparents' house in northeast Alabama. And, and I don't know why it was more so there than middle Tennessee, but they've got kudzu everywhere. Anybody seen kudzu before? Some of y'all just looked at me like, oh my gosh, kudzu. It's not an endorsement for kudzu. It's awful. I want to put a picture of kudzu up on the screen. There's no such thing as a kudzu farm, but this would qualify. <laughs> Do you know it was brought to America under the promise that it would stop soil erosion? What's happened in Waverly, Tennessee they have flooding because there was so much water over a period of time that it washed away the soil and flooded houses. That, that's, that's something we want to avoid. So people were promised, if you import this and plant it, the roots go down deep and they keep the soil from, from collapsing. It'll stop that. And also, it'll feed your livestock. It's a great source of vegetation. Guess what? Kudzu don't do neither. And that is so bad grammar. Like, it doesn't do anything that it was promised. And matter of fact, in this picture... It grows. Somebody in the first service said, did you know? I, I, no, I didn't know about kudzu. They said it grows three to four feet a day. Yes, wow and amen. Three to four feet a day. Some of us are connected to false vines that cannot do what they promise, but we think they can, and they grow in faster in our life than we think they are. And this kudzu has killed these trees. And if you Google pictures of kudzu, which if you are that boring, let's hang this afternoon, okay? Let's be with Jesus and be with each other. But if you want to Google it, you're going to find kudzu that has destroyed buildings. It consumes. 
just make sure. So, so here's the deal. If you do need to do something today, you're like, we're not supposed to do anything. So is that like a trick question? Like if, if you need to cut some vines out of your life, do it today. Relationships, career choices, whatever. I don't know what's going on in the room or what's going on with anybody joining us online. If you need to sever some false vines that cannot do what they promise, do it today. And by the way, you've seen two great examples from Ben and Kayla of obedience. I'm going to be obedient to what Jesus prompts me. The reason we have baptisms publicly when we gathered on Sunday is an encouragement, a shot in the arm to the body. Whatever God's calling you to do obediently, even if it's hard or difficult, you can do it. Brothers and sisters are doing it every day and every week. And one of the reasons you need to be in biblical community, a Bible reading group, a life group, is because you may leave here this morning and say, I need, I, I need to stop dating that person. I need to stop pursuing just money as the end all be all. I, but I don't know how to unwind that in my life. I don't even know how to move forward. You need people around you to help you figure that out that want God's best for you. You do. Jesus said, remain, remain, remain. You'll flourish, you'll flourish. It's literally the difference between life and death to abide with Jesus. If you've never chosen to abide with him by placing your faith in him, it is literally in your life a matter of spiritual life and death. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you forget, don't prioritize, lazy, complacent, or just, I won't abide with Jesus, it may not happen immediately, but think about Adam and Eve. It didn't happen at first, but they slowly started to die. It's a matter of life and death. The best advice I could give you after worshiping Jesus by the reading of his word, is be with Jesus. Be with Jesus. Be with Jesus. Got it. What's the next thing, Aaron? Mm -mm. Be with Jesus. If all that happens is in seven days we get together and say, church, all we did was be with Jesus for seven days and we got nothing to show for it. Awesome. Because guess what I bet God will do in our future? Watch what I'm about to do because you just want to be with me. I'll take that trade off. I want to take that trade off. Maybe you just need to pray today, give me a heart that wants to just be with you. It's okay to be a follower of Jesus and say, I don't feel that way on Monday morning at 530. <laughs> the Holy Spirit can change what you want. He can change your wanter. Pray, cause me to want more of Jesus. And, and if you're with Jesus, just, just do it a little bit each day for the next six days. Well done. Well done, and trust him with the outcome of your obedience, okay? Remain, remain, remain. I'm the only true vine. Cut loose the other false vines and watch me produce fruit. It's happening in our church, happening in your lives. This is a clarion call for us to abide with Jesus. Let me encourage you to bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment.